As you mentioned, investors bracing for this key speech tomorrow from Fed Chair Jay Powell at Jackson Hole. And the economic backdrop heading into the event, well, re-energized bond yields. The two-year note around 5 percent. The 10-year earlier this week, its highest level in more than 16 years. Joining us now, Louise Shainer, Senior Fellow and Policy Director for the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution, and PIMCO's Managing Director, Jerome Schneider. Welcome to both of you, and it's great to have you here. Uh, Louise, just quickly on the data, jobless claims, I'm sorry, durable goods, the headline was worse than expected, but jobless claims are strong, and there's no sign this economy is rolling over in the very near term. Yeah, I think this is consistent with a strong labor market, and on the durable goods, it is very volatile. Um, we had a huge number in June, so it was sort of payback from that. But the underlying data, I think, are reasonably strong. Um, so not higher than expected, kind of what we expected. So I think we have a strong economy and certainly a very strong labor market um, as we're rolling along. Jerome, is this a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get yields at 4 and 5%? Is it, are we going to look back in a year and say, oh, man, we should have been you know, seizing that opportunity? Or at that point, are they going to be twice as high? Well, the, I think the point is, is that we've seen a massive recalibration in sources of income over the past year, and that source of income is going to be quite generous for some period of time. Granted, there might be some periods of entry point that might be better than others, but where we are right now in the vicinity of approaching a 5% to your note, you know, obviously we've seen some recalibration out the curve. Those are Some of those technical factors are going to be driven by supply. Some of them are going to be driven by inflationary expectations. But all in all, the environment for looking at ways to reduce portfolio volatility and favor income is a very generous one at this point in time. Although we have to remind investors that we shouldn't expect markets nor data to, man to maneuver in a straight line. And we're obviously seeing that in the data today in terms right. of real time. But I guess, Jerome, the question would be, you know, are we really, do you really think, you, and you can pick, you can pick the short end, you can pick the long end. Do you really think they're going to go materially higher from here? It's not necessarily materially higher, but it's the response that we have to be thinking about that might be more protracted or, frankly, more debated, which leads to a longer runway uh, effectively toward, uh, toward those rate cuts that the market's anticipating later in 2024 and 2025. Those may or may not come to fruition. There's a lot of factors, including wage pressures, the robust numbers that we're getting in third quarter GDP, including the Fed's own Atlanta GDP now is uh, close to 6% at this point in time. There are very favorable factors. And then there's obviously some deterioration in corporate earnings that offset that. But ultimately, what we have to see is that if we hear a, a notion, a continued message that the Fed is going to fight inflation for the foreseeable future, that might mean that we are on hold here or perhaps slightly higher than we are now uh, as we enter the later months of, of 2023. That also means that we may not necessarily see rate cuts as quickly as the market forecast, as many suspect, going forward, which means that these higher rates are probably with us and the sources of income are with us for a good period of time. Real quickly, Louise, do you agree with that? I mean, what, if you had to summarize in a nutshell, what do you think we are going to hear from Powell tomorrow? Yeah, so I think we are going to hear a commitment to that 2% inflation because people are talking about maybe they should just declare victory if they don't get to 2 I think we'll hear a commitment to that. And I think we will hear a message both that the door is not closed to further rate hikes, depending on what happens with the data coming in, particularly inflation, not so much the real economy, but inflation. If it's not coming down, there may be more rate hikes. And then, in particular, that it's probably going to be higher for longer, right? Mm -hmm. I think they've sort of convinced the markets of that somewhat, but I think that's going to be the message that they are going to stay the course until they realize that inflation is definitely on its way down. And so it may well be higher for longer, um, and I think that's what he's going to emphasize. Rick? You know, let's move away from the Fed just for a second. Debt and supply. Going back to Graham Rudman, the Treasury market has rarely given us the kind of behavior we would expect when debt and supply were key issues. But maybe it's different this time. There's talk about one trillion servicing the debt. Rating agencies are weighing in. These are huge dynamics. Jerome, on interest rates, do you think they will pay more attention? Is the rise in long-end rates something unique, or is it as Bullard says that we're expecting much better growth, which I just don't see in a world that's on the verge of a global recession. Jerome, you want to respond yeah, to that? Yeah, quite honestly. Yeah, quite honestly, Rick, it's a great point here. And I think that what the market has forgotten about is a lesson in bond math, which is term premium, which means you're taking into account the longer term inflationary expectations and implications for a greater supply. And we're just finally starting to rationalize that out the curve. And granted, while we still have an inverted yield curve, these might be factors that come in over the secular horizon over the next few years 
that ultimately rely upon how the market digests this new, this new issuance, but more importantly, what the real rate, the nominal rates are going to be. So we might be in a period of time of higher real rates. We might be in a period of time where inflation doesn't necessarily go back to that 2% benchmark as quickly as people expect, which means that the market expectation for rates is probably a little bit higher than the normal average we've seen over the past generation or so. So these are all factors that come into play. It also leads to the fact that Ultimately, investors have to be nimble in this regard. There's going to be volatility in the markets. There's going to be opportunity also in the markets and the ability to position and be defensive, but yet be cautious and embrace these higher yields is, is, actually, is actually a perfect condition for being in fixed income at this point in time, given the outlooks. Do you, Louise, think that there is... Do you think is inflation's a, going to go ever ahead, get Rick, back sorry. to 2%, Jerome, in the near future? I'm sorry, Kelly. Go ahead. No, uh, it's a great question. Do you think we see 2% it, in the near future? Yeah. It's a great question, Rick, and I think ultimately the question with regard to that 2% will take some time in that regard. We might have to be accustomed to something just north of 2%, which will not necessarily be devastating, but not necessarily something that the Fed's going to be comfortable with. So we're going to have to recalibrate that. Ultimately, we have to be careful what we mean by inflation. And right now, that spotlight is going to move from goods and services to wage pressures. And we need to see how that materializes over the next year. So that road to 2%, if we get there, is going to be a little bit more protracted than people think.